I want to tell you something about um, the money. So um, if you haven't been keeping track, um, we're like almost $100,000 over budget in the amount you've given this year so far. Um, and then in addition to that, somebody else just gave us another $35,000. So we're a little bit stocked at the moment. So um, normally we know where the money's going because we have a budget. But when people don't respect that budget, um, <laughs> um, we have to come up with a spending plan. So the elders and some of the staff got together, and we, we thought it was really important that we share a spending plan for this, partly because our, our Constitution requires it. Because if we spend anything over 2% difference in the budget, the congregation has to approve it. So at the next congregational meeting in just a couple of weeks, we'll have a spending plan for about eighty-five to $90,000 of the hundred and fifteen or something we're ahead. Um, now— <clears throat> Here's what that means. One is, if you care what we're spending it on, come to the congregational meeting. But in that $85,000, is everything we feel like would possibly need to be spent here at High Point Church to, like, fund funds that fix things, and we're going to change the lights in here to much more energy-efficient lights that actually come on right when we turn them on, and some in the gym, and some things like that. Um, <clears throat> what that means is this. Right now, after we spend all of that, we'll be, like, $25,000 ahead. Every dollar that you give beyond our budgeted giving for the rest of the year, in June then, we will send out of here. Okay, it will all be—all that extra money then, because we spend everything we need to spend in-house. And everybody already—all the staff is there. It's all taken care of. So everything that we have, the additional overage, and everything you give over our budgeted amount, we can send out these doors to things that we think are kingdom investments, to missions, to our DR partnership— in the Dominican Republic, to um, some of the children's programs that we have funded through our year-end gift that we think are really effective. Um, we will invest every dollar outside of here in the lives of people for God's glory and for their good. So just know that from now until June, every dollar that you give above our budget is going to be going out of here for something missional. I just, I'm really thrilled to be able to say that. So that's cool. Um, we're going to— we're going to continue. I've never been at a church that has ever said that in my life. That's really—I'm really excited about that. And I did not make that happen. You did. So it's exciting. Um, open your Bible to um, Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 12. If you don't have one, the Pew Bible in front of you, it's page 1656. And I'm going to read verses 12 to the end of the chapter, which is verse 26. We started last week in the first 12 verses where Jesus, who had already risen from the dead and met with his disciples and gathered them together, said, I'm going to leave you. Um, you need to wait in the city of Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. And when he comes, you are going to be witnesses to, to, he said, to my life, death, and resurrection, and how people can be reconciled to God through me in the whole world. Right? He, he finished saying that. He went up to heaven, and this is what happens next. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. And when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture has been fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas. Now, that's not the Judas from a couple verses before. That's the Judas from the Gospels, the person who betrayed Jesus so that he could be arrested and killed, which it says in the next line, who served as a guide to those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number, meaning one of the 12 apostles, and shared in this ministry. With the payment he, Judas, received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field, and he fell headlong. His body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Try not to picture that. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, and so they called that field, in their language, a keldama, which is the field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, and let no one dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men whom have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus lived among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. 
So they nominated two men, Joseph, called Bersabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. And then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven apostles. And not just because he had only one name. Let me share with you um, last week for me. I promise I'm going somewhere sermonic with this, not just self-indulgent. Um, last week, I, um, I, I teach over at Abundant Life, Central, Abundant Life School on the east side because I play basketball there. They can ask me any question. This week it was, please explain Molinism, which is a soteriological view from medieval theology. And then I came back and I prepared eight months of sermons in Acts, outline-wise, and then tried to write one for this week. And then I had an hour and 15 minute argument discussion with Lloyd about how different races use worship and their functionalities and how those form personal spiritual habits and how we can embody that at a high point and all that kind of stuff. It wasn't like contentious, but we, I mean, we, Lloyd and I get into these things, and it's fun. And then I had to prepare a funeral a sermon for somebody who had died un, untimely, and then I led group prayer with the staff for all the prayer requests to come in, some of which are terrifyingly heartbreaking and some very encouraging. And then I had this really intense discussion with a gentleman about something that we really disagreed about in relationship to the gospel, which we both believed was very important, which neither of us agreed with the other by the end. And then I came back here, and I sat down with a family who the mom is something like 20, has two kids, and they're trying to figure out, because they don't go to church except for just, they just started— how to serve and follow Jesus in this new marriage of theirs while they have a newborn. Her father had died and was asking about how that works and, you know, how divorce has affected them and all these kinds of things. How do we follow Jesus? And then um, I got to meet with a a woman who has a severe muscular problem, and her car was coming apart, and some of our elders and people at our church, including Tom, who's our grounds person, um, got this van put together for her, and we got to give it to her. And um, this is a woman who you would not recognize her today if you had known her six months ago. I have—she accepted Christ this last year— She's been growing unbelievably. Two of our elders have spent literally countless hours with her, including finding her father, who had been estranged from her for more than 40 years, her finally seeing him, forgiving him for not protecting her from everything that happened to her in his absence, finding out that he's at hospice, just being reunited with her father and forgiving him, then finding out she's going to lose him, dealing with all of this, and being able to walk with her through that. And then just as I thought I was going to go home, I got a call from a couple whose eight-day-old son was just put on life support, and I got to go spend three hours with them. And that wasn't last week. That was Tuesday. Okay. Now, why do I tell you that? Right? Is it just self-indulgence and like, you know, you need to know that I'm going to like bury myself in internet shopping or that I'm going to eat myself to death on watermelon? And I will try this summer, I promise. But it's—and and, and some level, it's good for you sometimes to know what's happening behind the scenes and what I get, I get to be a part of and what I have to be a part of. And sometimes those are the same thing um, as a pastor, so you can—you know, you'll know differently how to listen to me. But mainly it's because—I tell you that because that's what your life is going to be like. Now, your life isn't going to normally be like my Tuesday, but listen, for that family that I went to go see, their Tuesday was worse than my Tuesday. And they're not in full-time ministry— And um, our lives are the kind of things that we have to prepare for. We have to become while we're being. You have to be right now. And while you're being right now, you have to be becoming what you're going to need to be to be later on when you're being it. See, that was coherent, right? It was. Yeah. And, w- and both of those have to happen. And as followers of Jesus, when we become Christians and we seek to follow Jesus and be disciples, we have to realize that part of being is being in such a way as that we become the thing we're going to need to be. In Christian faith, we use the word disciple or discipleship a lot. And sometimes that just sounds like a religious word. But here's what you need to know. In the book of Acts, you know how many times Christians are called Christians? 
twice, right? That's not curve, curveball. That's twice. And um, that's by people who didn't like them, right? What they're called, especially in the early chapters of Acts, is um, followers of the way, right? Meaning the truth about Jesus, and the disciples. They're just called the disciples. That is, um, and, and so discipleship, even outside of its religious context, means somebody who patterns their life after someone else because they follow and trust that person. It's not somebody who's a mild influence. I learned this guitar riff from that guy, and sometimes I use it. It's not that, okay? It's that you trust somebody so holistically that you, and you follow them co so completely, and you really pattern your life and character after them, right? When we look at these verses, one of the things that shows that discipleship is, is that it's faith expressed through a concrete action towards what God initiates. Now, the reason I say it that way is that sometimes people think in terms of you've got salvation and then you've got discipleship. People get saved, and then they learn the habits of Christianity, and they do discipleship. That's not—that's sort of true, but it's pretty misleading, because what discipleship is, is the application of faith. Everything that we do in discipleship is following a person because we trust them. The reason why we do it in terms of— you notice the relationship between the word discipleship and the word discipline? The reason why we have to do it in ways that are decisive and disciplined is that when, when God initiates something and we're responsive to it, just how we want to respond isn't necessarily how we're going to respond, right? I mean, think about the last time you said something you really wish later you hadn't said, right? Those of us who are married or who have children or parents, which is probably some of us, um, you know, you, I mean, I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've watched parents and how many times my wife has watched a parent say something to their kids that if they had been able, if the moment it happened, you could freeze time like Zach in Saved by the Bell, and you could step away and think for two minutes about what you were going to say, okay? So like you had two full minutes, like your kid did something, and then poof, everything stops. You walk away for two minutes, and you go, okay, that just happened. They are a kid, but I don't want them doing that for the rest of their life. And you're like, okay, I think I'm going to say this. And then you go back, and you say that. That's not what you actually said. And it's part—and here's why, right? Because you'd be like, well, I can't think that fast. That's not the reason. Here's the reason. Because you have a human habit that is not in line with your philosophical and theological beliefs, okay? Your upbringing, your previous choices, what you do has wired you to react a certain way to things and act a certain way. And that just takes over, right? In Charles Dunning's book, The Power of Habit, that was a bestseller last year, he said that uh, the, the best studies they could do on this is 46% of what we do in a day is just habit. You don't even think about it. It never occurs to you. It just happens, and that's not just tying your shoe. It's lots of stuff, including things you say and how you respond to other things, other things other people say. And you see, if you want to follow Jesus 100% of the time, you have to take by the horns and push on the face of all of the habits of our personal formation that point in the other direction. So what we believe about Jesus, the truths that he's initiated, have to be turned into actions that we do over and over in a disciplined way that reform us so that what we do is along with what we believe rather than whatever else pre-programmed us. That is why Christianity has practices. If we were floating spirits with no brains and bodies, it might be possible for God to just tell us something and we would just believe it and do it 100% of the time. But that's not what we are. And so would we seek to follow Jesus really, to apply our faith deeply and holistically and completely, we cannot just believe the gospel. We have to believe the gospel in deliberate decisions that change our trajectory, and then we need to codify those decisions by engaging in a discipline that forms us in that direction so that we can actually do it. Does that make sense? Now, I want to look at two of those that are in this passage, okay? There's one decisive action, and then there's one set of ongoing disciplines. Okay, let's do ongoing disciplines first. It says in this passage, when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying, so they actually were already getting together, right? And then it says, 
those present were the disciples, right? And then it says what in 14? They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary and the, the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. Now, I mean, do you see what they're doing here? Now, the question then is, why do they do that? Why those things? What? Is that just random? Right? And the answer is, no, it's not random, because it's exactly what Jesus— it's a response to something Jesus explicitly said. Think about this. Look at, look in verse 7 and 8 in that chapter. It says, Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times and dates the Father has set by his own authority to do something else they were talking about, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. So there's two things he's saying. You're going to receive this powerful person, the Holy Spirit, who's going to empower you to do amazing stuff, and you're going to be my witnesses. And everything they do in these verses is a response to that. You see? They believe in Jesus. Like, no kidding. They believe. And so when Jesus goes, listen, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. You need to wait for that. When it happens, you will know, right? You need to wait for the Holy Spirit. And then you're going to be my witnesses. And they go, okay. And Jesus goes. And so they go away. And what do they do? They go, okay, given what Jesus just told us, how would we act? What decisions would we make? What disciplines would we engage in? Such that we would be living out what Jesus said. And they go, here's what we would do. We would be together, and we would influence each other in that direction. We would ask God for what we need from him, because half of what Jesus says is we need something very specific from God, and we need to receive it. And therefore, in doing so, we need to position ourselves for receptivity. We need, to, we need to continue the discipline of recognizing what we need we get from God, right? And we're going to do that together, and we're going to do it specifically by praying, right? Because— that's what Jesus said. And here, let me tell you something about this, and we're going to find this out as we go through the book. After the Holy Spirit comes, these things do not become obsolete. What you'll find is that all the way through Acts, they keep doing these things. Because Holy Spirit or not, it's still what people need to do. And see, what, what some of us need to realize is this. Because we actually have relatively false ideas that we got from our culture— but relatively false ideas about how people become themselves and what prayer is and how much we're actually dependent on God. Because we don't believe rightly about those things, those three things, doing those regularly as part of your life, sounds like a fate worse than death. What it sounds like is you're going to have to be around annoying religious people. You're going to have to talk to the ceiling as though it was this appointment for coffee with Jesus that he never shows up for and keeps rescheduling. And then— right? You're going to have to be walked all over the place and never be assertive personally in terms of yourself because you're going to be constantly in the position of receptivity. I'm telling you, if you're a Christian, the reason you think that way is you don't understand Christianity, okay? The way people become themselves, you can't decide what you're going to be in terms of like just becoming yourself. You just go, I'm going to be like this. I'm going to be that, that way. No, no, no. The only thing you—there's certain things you can do. You can do certain personal disciplines, but the main thing that's going to determine what you're going to be like is the people you choose to put yourself around. Because human beings just become more like the people we put ourselves around. And so the choice of who you're going to be is the choice of who you're going to spend time with, who are going to, and who are going to be not just who you're ever around, but the people who are in the inner concentric circles of your relationships. So listen, if you're not married, and you pick a spouse— you are deciding who you're going to become. Because that person is going to influence you a lot, for good or ill, right? When you decide who that first person you call is when something happens, and you, you know darn well before you ever call them what they're going to do. And so if you call them to complain, you already know whether they're going to say, oh, sweetie, you're so right. He should never treat you like that. You deserve better than him. Or whether he's going to be like, look, I get it. I get it that this is the 160th time. Shut your face. This isn't going to produce anything good, what we're doing right now. What do, you, what do you think Jesus wants us to do? Like, in what sense should you assert yourself? And in what sense should you trust God? And in what sense can you control? What can you control and what, you can't, what can't you control? Let's think this through, right? 
Or call me back when you're not emotionally flooding, right? And we'll talk about this. I promise. Call, number, call, call, your, call the person who wants to listen to you complain and who wants to destroy your character. You call, call that so-called friend, okay? Right. You, when you choose who is that person, when you choose who it is you text, when you choose who's your closest intimate, when you choose those things, you are choosing who you're going to be. And it's not just kids. We need to quit being like, well, you shouldn't be friends with that girl because I don't like the cut of her jib, and then I'm going to be friends with this idiotic person. Right? I mean, like, it's everybody. It's all of us. It doesn't matter how old you are. I don't know how many old people make friends with other curmudgeon old people, and it just makes them more curmudgeon They're like, I didn't like that guitar solo. Did you like that? I thought it was very discordant. <laughs> and the other person is like, I did too. I don't know why those young people think that that's music. Right? And like, no, you need to make, be friends with an old person who's like, yeah, you know what? It actually hurt my ears and I turned off my hearing aid. But listen, <laughs> aren't you glad they're here? And listen, they're not just here like we can help them, but like some of them are really passionate about Jesus. And they're going to take the church into the next generation. I'm so glad that this isn't going to die with us. And that's what you need, right? And if you don't, I can make you some recordings if you can't find a person, you know. And then prayer is very similar to that, right? When you don't understand what— prayer is not a place where you try to manipulate God, but it's also not a place for those of you who are slightly more pious, where you try to manipulate yourself. Where you go and you be like, God, I want to have a peaceful heart, and then you basically try to focus on making a peaceful heart. That's called, you know, Buddhism. And it's—and it it, it helps. It's not like it's a completely unhelpful internal, personal, psychological exercise, but that's not prayer. That's all. And so you can do that. You can like, you, you can meditate. It's Christian meditation. You read the Bible. You think about its truth. You let that affect you psychologically. We got meditation. It's not a problem. But that's not what prayer is. God is actually there. You're not going to tell him anything he doesn't know. He deeply cares about you. He wants you to come in, and one of the main things he wants you to get out of it is a repositioning and a remembrance of receptivity. That's the main thing you need from prayer. And sometimes you'll ask for stuff, and he'll be like, awesome, and do it. And other times he'll be like, well, I'm kind of doing this whole global cosmic thing, and that little thing you want, is it going to fit right now? And you know what I mean? But the point, the, the, one of the biggest issues with prayer is that we would talk to God in faith and exercise the discipline and muscle of faith and do something that is objectively truthful, which is speaking to one who we believe is there and expressing to God what God deserves to hear, which is his own praise and our deep dependence on him, which would leave us not in a constructed place of psychological receptivity, but a real place that comes from rehearsing our need for receptivity and his absolute sovereignty and glory, so that when we walk out the door— and God starts to actually create the character trait we actually prayed for by bringing an idiot into our life, we would recognize that because we're already in a position of receptivity. So we go, God, I really wish I was patient. And then we try to create the patient feeling in our head, right? And so God needs to teach us that's idiotic, right? So we walk out, and the annoying person shows up, and all of a sudden we don't feel patient. We realize, oh my gosh, when I was creating the psychology of patience— by myself alone, that actually was a completely vacuous kind of patience that I can generate when there's nothing happening to try my patience. Even though I was still getting impatient when I was praying right after that, because God wasn't doing what I was asking him to. But now that this person is here, I realize that my patience is not very structurally sound, right? But if you're in a position of receptivity, you can say, oh, I, I, you want to actually build a habit of patience, so I need to rethink this theologically. I'm not the most important person in this situation. This person's made in your image. I'm to love them. Okay, that's rearranging this. Rethink, refeel, react. And then you run, run into person B who tries your patience. Oh, I get it. I get it, God. Rethink the theology, refeel the emotion, redo the action. And meanwhile, what the biologists are going to say is, your brain's rewiring, right? How, we say that in Christian language, that in a lot more that's happening, we call that discipleship, 
right? The habit reforms the character so that after a while you run to the annoying person and you already think the theology straight, therefore you already feel the feeling straight, and then you naturally act like you wish you would have before. But God does it through a process because he's doing it in an embodied person, and that happens when we go through the long-term disciplines of belonging to the family of God in real spiritual community, seeing prayer for what it really is, and losing our cynicism about it, and then letting those things put us in a position of spiritual receptivity. There are a lot of people who think that they belong to Christian spiritual community, and they don't. Okay? One of the phrases I use around here, instead of, you need a Christian friendship— which you do, it, but that's too vague, right? Have you ever heard somebody, you need a Christian friendship. You need to get it. No, see, because you can become friends with a Christian and still talk about all the same things as you did with your non-Christian friend, right? You can be talking about your fantasy football team and isn't the weather terrible in Wisconsin and, you know, when, you know, I was, you know, I was driving to church and reindeer were crossing the road, right? I mean, and that's, and, but they're really a Christian. That's not a, that's not the kind of friendship we're talking about. What we're talking about is a Christian spiritual friendship, one in which Jesus and scripture and discipleship and hope and godliness come up as much as fantasy football and the weather and your job and your—and Jesus interjects, and then you talk about this, and it's not all religious talk, but there is an organicness between Jesus and everything else in life because it's all reality to that person, because they see the world faithfully with Jesus as king and everything else, where it goes. And when it comes to the local church, because that's not just the inner circle of your intimate friendships, this is one of the reasons why we have small groups. Because you need to not just have these intimates that relate to you, but you need to relate to other people, especially people you don't think can offer you much, who are different from you, specifically in age, intergenerationally, and hopefully in terms of race and background, and— Some of them are weird, and a good number of them you don't particularly like. And their tastes are generally different from yours. And so you only really like perfectly for yourself about a third of what happens. Okay? That's what you need to be part of. And that's why you need to be part of the local church, because this is not a religious good and service that you're consuming, that if you like the way I speak, or you like the way they play, whatever. I remember reading a book about, about a guy who would go to this one church's worship, and he would— go and he would get breakfast at a fast food restaurant and be able to get there right when the pastor was getting on stage at another church. Because the two churches were so tightly programmed, and Wendy's was so tightly programmed that he could do it all, right? And I remember telling some 20-year-old staff members that, and they were like, yeah, what's wrong with that? And I said, because that's not what church is. You're not consuming religious goods and services. You are embedding yourself into a community and family of people that you are bound with through eternal spiritual ties in concrete real persons that don't change. Because it is the only way to be spiritually formed the way you need to be. And that completely falls apart when we come to hear the the pastor talk. Or, oh, wasn't that a good sermon? And maybe I should go listen to that person. And, well, he's not good as the guy I listened to on my podcast. And, oh, the music is like that. Does that make sense? We do this because the Word of God is important, and we need to all be gathered around similar truths and understand what— so that we can actually be drawn more together as a family and accomplish more together. But this isn't church, right? We're the church. And if we're the church, you can't be moving in and out of it like it's consumer things, right? And so this is what I always ask people, whether they're young or old, who are relating to the church in that kind of way. <clears throat> I always say this, who are the shepherds under which you put yourself whom you have invited to spiritually meddle in your life? Which church is it? Because they go, well, I go to these three churches. I go, which is your church? They go, well, I don't really know. I go, all three. I go, well, Here's the question. Which church's elders or spiritual leadership have you put yourself under? I don't mean small group leader, and I don't mean women's ministry leader. I mean which pastors, that is elders, pastors, you've put yourself, you've invited them to meddle in your life and tell you what they fear for you and what they see in you. And if you can't answer that question— you are not really yet part of the fellowship of the community of the family of God. 
but you can be. You just got to make a choice, you've got to make a decision, and then you've got to engage in the discipline. And you will learn to love it immensely. All right, let's move on. The second thing is decisive action. So w- one of the things we saw them do was these repetitive things that they did over and over again. And even after the Holy Spirit comes in chapter 2, we see them doing it again and again all the way through the life of the church. They're continually valid. And those, the things I talked about are not the only things. Those are examples. But there are lots of things in our spiritual lives that are worth ongoing disciplines. But you have to decide what they are, because otherwise if I tell you like 19 of them, and you feel like you've got to do them all all the time, that just becomes oppressive and you'll just quit. You need to—I I know a couple that you need to do, because the Bible explicitly says you need to do them. You need to pray, not for any particular length of time, or any exact frequency in the Bible, but you need to pray. From time to time, you should be talking to God and put yourself in a position of spiritual receptivity. The Bible absolutely teaches that, right? Two, you need to be part of the local, concrete family of God. A church that knows it's part of something bigger, and that is preferably intergenerational and multicultural. But that's really hard to do. So if you can't get that, you still need to be part of a church. And then there's lots of other ones, like reading the Bible and some other things like that. We can sort those out as we go. And we will, because Acts brings them up again. But sometimes you don't need a new discipline until you— you ha- before you can get the right discipline, you need to make the right di- action decision. You need to change the trajectory. If you're going this direction and you go, oh, let me put disciplines in place. Well, you may actually need to change the direction before you put the discipline in place. Right? Sometimes you need to make a decisive change about trajectory, because trajectories make a huge difference. They're only a little bit at the beginning, but if you stretch them out a ways, it's a big change. Now, the, the trajectory di- question on this one is a little bit more complicated because it connects with the Old Testament and messianic prophecies and all the kind of stuff we'll get to in just a second. But it's actually not that big a tangle. If you're a fisherman, you might look at that snarl. If you're not a fisherman, you're like, okay, get out the pliers because that's not going to work. But I'm a fisherman, or at least I used to be, back when I f- lived around larger fish in the ocean. Um, that's actually not that bad. You know how to pull it out and pull it? And it's, 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 not, it's not hard. And th- this is similar to that, in that why did Peter say the decisive action was we need to appoint another apostle? Like, isn't Jesus the only person who can do that? Right? I mean, what's, what's going on with that? But wh- why that? Why did Peter say, I know what we need to do while we're waiting for the Holy Spirit and we're doing this practice. Here's the decisive thing we need to do to get ready for what God is going to do. We need to appoint another apostle. And people were like, sure, yeah, that's what we should do. They went along with it. Why did they go along with it? Here's why. Because in Isaiah, I preached about this several months ago, God says about the Messiah, it's too small a thing for you to just save Israel. You're going to save the whole world. The message of how you're going to redeem people is going to go everywhere. And that sounds like a great idea. But then when Jesus came, he said, "Um, I have come only for the lost sheep of Israel. Jesus' ministry was very specifically focused on just Jews. Now, how does that work? Because the Bible explicitly says that the Messiah is going to be for everybody, and yet, when the Messiah came, he told this Canaanite woman, he's like, he's like, listen, I can't heal your demon-possessed daughter. He's like, it's not okay to take food off the table and throw it to dogs. Right? Remember that verse? It's a fun verse, right? And she says, yeah, that works. I mean, the dogs eat what's under the table. Whatever you want to, you know, whatever you want to flick, I'll take. Like, that'd be great. And he goes, not bad. And he heals her daughter, right? It's a great passage. But theologically, Jesus is right. He's there for the Jews. When he sends out the 70 later on in the Gospels, they go only to the Jews. He tells them specifically to only go to Jews. You see, the the disciples begin to put together that Jesus died for everybody, but the means by which the Messiah was going to be for everybody is that they were going to hear about it actually through, well, us. Like the church, the people that were his followers. And so here's Peter, apparently while he's waiting for the Holy Spirit and praying and being with the community of believers, he's reading his Bible. And he's reading along in the book of Psalms, and he gets to Psalm 69. He's reading along and he goes, this reminds me of something, right? He's reading along and he goes, there's all these things about pain and scorn, and he reads verse 1, he goes, They put gall in my food and vinegar, gave me vinegar for my thirst. Now David is writing about how people have misused him as God's point leader in the people of God at the time. 
And it's like they put gall on his food and gave him vinegar to drink. Now, if you've ever tried to drink vinegar as like a side thing, it's, it's unrefreshing, okay? And so, but it's liquid, you know, and it doesn't have a lot of bacteria in it. And so um, Peter reads that and he goes, wait a second, that exactly happened to somebody I know. I mean, like literally exactly, like they— did that with Jesus when he was on the cross. They mixed something that they would refer to as gall with something to give to Jesus as a pain dollar. And then when he said, I thirst, they mixed a certain kind of wine vinegar together and put it in a sponge and gave it to Jesus to drink. And he goes, wait a second. I remember that happening. And he keeps reading, he goes, the table is set before them. May it become a snare, meaning the people who've, who've done terrible things to him. May it become retribution and a trap. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see. May their backs be bent forever. Pour out your wrath on them. Let your fierce anger overtake them. May their place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in their tents. But what did Jesus say about the judgment of the people who crucified him when he was on the cross? Do you remember? He said, Father, destroy them and send them to the hottest portion of hell that could ever be devised by your divine creativity. You remember that? You know, I can quote it in Greek for you. Right? It's actually not what he says, is it? He says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Now, on one level, that sounds very sweet, right? Because it is. Right? But think about this. Jesus actually gives the grounds in that statement for why these people might not be condemned. He's being sincere. They really don't know what they're doing. They don't know that he's the Messiah. They don't, they do not understand that he is the fulfillment of 1,500 years of prophecy and, and the end to which the world is pointed for the redemption of all people, and they're murdering him. They, they really— Pilate and these people, they're, they're, they're clued in a little bit, but they don't really know what they're doing. But there is one person who did know what he was doing, or should have. There is one person that is never going to be able to plead ignorance on that one. It's Judas. And so Peter reads this and he goes, yes, when David was the point person in God's redemptive plan, and people who had been drawn into leadership and were close to him, close enough to hurt him, when they attacked him and they did these sorts of things to him, David said, let them be removed from their place of leadership because it's not fitting that they would influence and do things and the, the leadership should be freed of them. And then a couple days later, you know, he's reading along. Now, I mean, obviously I'm speculating exactly how he comes to this other passage. Oh yeah, I don't have time to talk about the— Judas said, talk to me afterwards if that's a stumbling block for you about how it's just, his death is described in the gospel and in Acts. Because it's really easy to answer, but, and skeptics make a big deal of it, but it's actually not much of a contradiction. Um, and then he gets to Psalm 109, and he's reading in here, and here's, here's what he reads. O God, and this is again David talking about his own suffering. O God, whom I praise, do not remain silent. For the wicked, for wicked and deceitful men, right? So Judas is a liar who brings, right? have opened their mouths against me. They have spoken against me with lying tongues. With words of hatred, they surround me. They attack me without cause. Right? So an innocent person is being attacked deceitfully by people he should be able to trust. In return for my friendship, they accuse me, but I am a man of prayer. Now that sounds a little bit pious, right? God, people are so mean to me, but all I ever do is pray. Maybe you could like smite them with the smitingness of smiting. And, right? But think about this for just a second. How did Jesus get turned over to the people who killed him by Judas? How did he actually execute that? Right? If you remember the Gospels, Jesus leaves dinner where he stayed for hours. It was a perfectly enclosed place to arrest somebody. Judas knew they were going to go from there and they were going to pray. So Ju Judas leaves. He goes and he gets the people who are going to arrest Jesus. Remember this? Jesus goes to Gethsemane. He prays. He, he, he like yells at the other apostles because they can't stay awake while he prays. He finally gets up precisely to turn around for Judas to come and kiss him on the cheek and say, hello, teacher, because the people who were going to arrest Jesus didn't even know what they were doing clearly enough to know to arrest the right guy out of 11. Okay? Now, they might have all had the same hipster beard. I get it. But and that obscures the facial features. But they, they didn't know 
Jesus, en enough about Jesus to know they were going to arrest Jesus. You know, they could have arrested like John Mark and hauled him off and like, right? So the point is, Peter reads that and he goes, wait a second, that's literally the man of prayer turns and the one to whom he gave friendship, that is, the one he said, I, I haven't called you servants, I've called you my friends. The, the 12 disciples were his closest intimates in which he gave the most devout friendship to. And this passage says, in response to what I gave, I got hatred for friendship. Look at verse 5. They repay me evil for good in hatred for friendship. Then skip down to verse 7. I could say a lot more about how 6 applies. Verse 7. When he is tried, meaning the one who betrays, when he is tried, let him be found guilty. And may his prayers condemn him, and may his days be few, and may another take his place of leadership. Because David says, not only should the betrayer be removed, but the place of leadership has to be filled. One of the things that you'll find in the Bible is that God is actually very serious about leadership and how his people are led. And so Peter sees that, and he goes, wait a second. That's something that needs to be prepared. That's something that needs to be done. Jesus said that just 120 of us who are here are going to become a worldwide movement of sharing the, mes the message of the Savior. The 12 of us are supposed to lead this. One of them's a betrayer, and he needed to be removed, and he received the condemnation of God that Psalm 69 talked about. But yet, what David said was when those people are removed, another should take their place of leadership. Because even though that person has to be removed because of the kind of person they are, yet some Somebody should be there. Leadership is important. We need to find the right person. So what are we supposed to be? We're supposed to be witnesses. So who's the most confident person? Somebody who's been with us the whole time of what we're going to be witnessing. The beginning of Jesus' ministry, the baptism of John, to his ascension. And so they get everybody together. They get the guy with the three names and Matthias, right? And then what's the— they got two good candidates. What's the final decision based on? God, you know the heart. You tell us who you've picked, right? And they get the one with a name that's easier to write. Matthias. Who we never hear another word about. So Matthias is not the point. The point here is not Matthias was elevated, right? There's not a word breathed about Math Matthias in Scripture other than this, right? Apparently the other guy was decently well-known. Because he had nicknames and stuff, right? The, the point is not Matthias. The point is the action. The point is that Peter listened to what God initiated, looked at what God had revealed, sought to put these things together with other people. He finally figures out that, wait, God judicially removed Judas. We should replace him in leadership because the 12 have to be sound to lead this new movement. We need to be ready. Somebody needs to be ready with us. Who should it be? Let's appoint somebody. And let's do it on the basis of qualification and then clarity of the kind of heart that they have. I think one of the things that um, we have to recognize is that God is very serious about who leads his people. And um, we have to have a complete renaissance on the, our understanding of leadership and a complete renaissance on our understanding of following. I was talking to a guy after last service. He'd started coming to this church um, after being a pastor for 20 years. He was in the military, and his first master's thesis was, he said, in human resources, where they actually interviewed people and asked if they, if they were a leader or a follower. Right? Are you a leader or are you a follower? Are you a leader or are you a follower, right? You know what the percentage of people who said um, they were a leader was? Right? It's worse than Lake Wobegon, right? He said it was in the high 90s every time. He said, in fact, he said they would, they would interview people, and they would actually write down verbatim their response. And he said, you would not believe the number of people who said, he said, he, they said, they said this statement verbatim. Well, I'm probably not a leader, but I'm sure no D-A-M-N follower. Because culturally, being a follower means being sort of mindless. It's being a lemming or a sheep or something where you just kind of like, well, wherever you take me, I'll kind of go and I'll just be a big idiot. And yet, following— I want you to listen to this next sentence, not because it's publishable, but I just want you to listen to it because it is, it is not just, I think, true from the Bible, but it is culturally very countercultural, and you need to hear it, Okay. 
following is the lifeblood of accomplishment. It is, following is the absolute lifeblood of accomplishment. Because most accomplishments are relatively complex. And in order to accomplish them, lots of people need to play diverse roles, and they need to do them with great excellence. And so in order to accomplish great things, you need lots of people willing to say, tell me what to do. They do it, and they do it with all their heart. And they don't see the big picture, and they don't complain about whether or not the big picture is perfect, or whether or not the leader is doing everything perfect. There's no such thing as that. And they recognize, and listen, the discipline of being a follower— is one of the most important disciplines anyone can possibly possess. And it is one of the most undeveloped human habits that we have in America right now among all of us. Right? And here's the thing. Here's what you'll find out. Of the 90-whatever percent that say that they're leaders, about 3 percent actually are. The right kind. I'm not talking about the people that want their name known, the like, worship of celebrity, look at me, I'm an extrovert leaders. I'm talking about the people who wish they didn't have to. Okay? Like, I, man, I cannot wait till we find somebody to put me out to pasture. <laughs> I mean, I just can't wait. I mean, I can't, I mean, do you know how many pastors, like, do you know how many pastors that, like, this, this is what they're like? I mean, it's just, they're like, I'm not gonna, you are not gonna take my, I'm not gonna give this thing up. You need to back off. I can be interesting 52 weeks a year, even if I'm dying of stress-related causes, and you need to you need to back the— f Okay. <laughs> like, that's what it's— Like, I'm figuring out, like, when can I do five less sermons? I just—I mean, as soon as possible, right? I, 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 I mean, I, and I took this from St. Chrysostom in the fourth century. He said in his book on the priesthood, he said, the only person who leads God's church properly is the one who is as glad to be deposed as elevated. No one is qualified to lead anything in Christ's church who will not simply do what's right and take just as much joy in being kicked out of the church as being elevated in it. Right? It's one of the things I love about George Washington. All the man ever wanted to do was to go home to Virginia and to grow some good tobacco. Okay, it's like that's all he wanted to do. Right? And it's one of the things I love about that guy. Like, and he just kept— but he believed people should be free, and he believed— in good, I mean, he just believed in certain things, and so his convictions— and Chrysostom said it this way. He said, Paul did not say in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that those who want to be respected should become elders. He, Chrysostom said, Paul said, those who desire the blank of an elder desire a noble thing. What is that? Those who desire the— anybody know? The work of an elder. That's what the verse says. You'd think it would be office, right? No, it's not office. Paul does not say office. He says, to the one who wants the work of an elder, the one who, when that family's baby is on life support, wants to drop everything and be at that hospital with them and cry with them and pray with them and encourage them that there's no good decision. There's just only one of the bad decisions. And that's the person. The person who doesn't say, well, I can't wait to get up on stage, but actually gets out their stuff, sits in their office, learns the languages, works on the passage, tries to make it clear, tries to make it compelling, tries to make sure they've interpreted the passage right, and labors and beats the passage until it gives up its truth. No matter how many times they have to take a break and come back and focus and take a break and come back and focus. That is the person. Listen, I tell you this because in a couple months, you're going to elect like five elders. And you may not want to be a leader, but part of the discipline of following is knowing how to pick them and knowing how to follow them. And we've got to pick five, like five elders in a couple of months. And you should be looking around right now because you're going to—our members and even our attenders can nominate people. And most of those men, you know what they're going to say? They're going to say, no, I don't really feel called to it right now. You know why? Because it's a lot of work. It's a lot of time away from your family. It's just a time you wish you could put your kids to bed and hang out with your spouse. You're here at these incredibly boring meetings for hours until 11, dealing with problems. And they are the lifeblood 
of the protection of the health of this church. Those, in fact, you could probably look around in this room, and there's elders in this room right now, and you probably don't even know who they are, most of you. And it's fine. It's totally fine. But listen, they have served you in ways you can't even imagine. You just don't even know how they've affected your life, and they have. Because they stand guard over the heart and who leads here and who we get and who we ask to not be here and all of those things. And we've got two very important staff positions we're looking for people for. Right? We've got to find the right person for both of those. I'll tell you a story about that's, that's, um, that picks on Derek since he's here. And ultimately he comes out nice, even though it's— we were, So we were doing the youth pastor search, right? And I was picking a youth pastor for my own kid right? And there was this person we really wanted to hire. He was like, he had a master's degree in theology. He was from California. He was biracial in all the cool ways. And, um, <clears throat> but he was theologically a little vacuous, and he wouldn't admit it. And I, you could tell that he liked doing stuff more than he liked kids, right? And so I have kind of this bad reputation when I'm on committees of running candidates off. And so, in this interview, I started asking questions of this candidate that actually put a finger on how badly he had been a theological student, and how poor his, his theology was, and how poorly he had understood the scriptures, and how, how shallow his readings and understandings of passages were. And he dropped out next week, he dropped out of the race, right? We were okay with that because we had interviewed Derek, and what we knew about Derek was that he was this country boy from the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania, that probably was going to be terrible at all kinds of stuff. Um, <laughs> just kidding. But here's, here, here's what Derek said in his interview. Um, here's what we found out. He said, he said that he used to walk through certain parts of Catawissa, down the sidewalk, just hoping that families would be grilling out kind of in front of their house so that he could talk to them. People didn't go to his church because they might have kids that he might be able to invite, that he might be able to pastor. Right? Now listen, I can teach people how to preach, okay? You interpret the passage right, you make the outline clear, you find a way to make it compelling. It's not that hard, okay? Almost anybody can do it passively after some practice. You can't know you can turn somebody's heart. You can put people in certain situations. You can challenge people at the right moment. I mean, I, I do that too. I try to get people heart-wise. I mean, that's what my sermons are all about too, right? I'm trying to like poke you in the right place and kick you in the right way and kind of like invite you and give you kind of a hug and then kind of like stick you with something and like try to put it so that this moment will come and you'll be like, right, or Jesus, or uh, something that will move, change, direct the heart to a place that's better. But I can't know if I can do that. So when I pick somebody on staff, the heart has got to be right. It's got to be right. They got to just as soon get kicked out as anything. Um, it, like, yeah, I mean, just people who, you know, people—I mean, Derek didn't—I don't th I think he accepted the job before he asked how much we were going to pay him, right? He talked us down. When Lloyd and I took him out, we th this literally happened. We took him out for lunch, and we told him how much we wanted to pay him, and he tried to, he tried to talk us down, okay? Like, that's—now, that can be a little coy, but that's—no, he was just kind of like, well, I think that's too much, right? That's, that's very different than most candidates for most jobs in most churches. I didn't do that. <laughs> it's true. <clears throat> um, this church will partly succeed or fail on the heart, the humility, the intensity, the love of Christ, the, the desire to see what God is doing and to follow it rather than only lean on our own understanding of programmatic advantages and mixing these two, pri all that. And you and I need to both learn how to follow well and accept that in real humility that it's a calling to follow well and yet to be very focused on making sure we pick and we bring in and we depose and we follow leadership that will lead us in good places. Now, let me end with this. These are all still just examples of two things that are at the heart of discipleship making decisions for a direction and putting in place disciplines that reform us into the person we're meant to be. 
And when you recognize those two things, you begin to think about them. They feed off of each other. God, I need to make a decision that I'm going to follow you and just not myself on these things. Okay, how are you going to do that? I'm going to commit and discipline to be in a community of believers that will help me do that. I'm going to go to church every week, whether I like those darn people or not. And those feed off each other. The more you go to church, the more you build that conviction. The more you build that conviction, the more you'll do the discipline, and they feed it. God, I want to know you more. I know that you've revealed yourself in your written word, and in Jesus Christ testified in your written word. I'm going to read the Bible for five minutes a day. And the more you read that Bible for five minutes a day, with a position of receptivity, the more you will recognize that God is worth knowing, the more you will want to know him, and then the more you'll want to read your Bible for seven minutes a day. They feed off of each other as long as we recognize that discipleship is a response of faith to what God has initiated. And it is sometimes a decision about a direction. Sometimes it is a discipline. But both of these are not actions of moralism. They're actions of faith. Because you believe the one who would lead you to both of them. The band's going to come back up here right now, and we're going to end with a song and— um, some of you shouldn't even sing it, okay? Some of, some of us just need to say, what's that decision? What's that discipline? And you, and you may already know. And what I would encourage you is to seek to put yourself in a position of receptivity through prayer. Tell God what you know about him. Tell God what you know he knows about you. Accept the truth in faith and put yourself in a position of receptivity. If you do that over the next three minutes— Think of the difference that the, a little tiny trajectory could make over the next years of your life. Let's pray. Father, as we, um, as, we, as we come to this moment now, we pray that you would help us to open our hearts to you, open our minds, our lives to you, to be open to being decisive about the decisions you want us to make, and to be open to the disciplines we should embrace. We pray that we wouldn't do them out of self-righteousness, out of moralism to try to get you to do things for us if we act right, but that we would accept it out of faith. We would look at what you have called us and initiated us to, and that we would embrace what we know you're leading us towards. And I pray that it would be enormously freeing, that it would produce immediately a transition of unease before you to full peace, and that it would aliven in us, even in the middle of February, hope. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.